started this morning. Just want to make an announcement. Remember, next, we didn't get Sunday school material in, did we? We did not. Uh, we had a thing from the post office. I went up to get it. I thought I was going to get some big boxes of material, and I got a little on the way. So it wasn't nice. Okay. All right. So uh, okay. Okay. Uh, we'll get it done. Okay. All right. So not next Sunday then. Um, so we won't we won't be starting Sunday school next Sunday. As soon as we get the material in, we're gonna be starting Sunday school back at ten o'clock. All right. Trivia question from last week. Where did Aaron die? Anybody get that one? Mount Four. Mount Four. H O R. Mount Four. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, now, just so you know. Uh, if you ever cut your own hair, uh, make sure you know what size clipper is on it. <laughs> if you don't, this is what happens. <laughs> I did that this morning. Um, didn't look. And uh, now, the reason the very, very short one was on there was because about three weeks ago when I cut my hair, the uh, normal size one fell off and there was no clipper that went through. Oh. So uh, she put the short one on there and kind of faded it out a little bit, I guess, so the short one stayed on. <laughs> this is what you look like when you don't pay attention. All right. Uh, <laughs> any, anybody have any questions, comments, anything like that? Um, now, I guess y'all have noticed in the past that on Sunday mornings, um, I kind of, uh, we kind of preach about uh, the Lord as uh, kind of a challenge, uh, kind of an invitation. On Wednesday nights, though, on Wednesday nights, we preach to uh, educate your mind, to teach you about the Bible in detail, where you can ask questions and we can break it down and stuff like that. So we do encourage you to come on Wednesday night. So uh, if you haven't been able to come, we appreciate uh, we appreciate that you would try us out and uh, and hopefully. Okay. I don't know. Uh, that was gonna be my next thing. Um, next thing I guess y'all noticed is we've got the cameras up. Jeff has got, came and got those up, and, and he put those in. We appreciate that. Now, are we going out live now? No. Okay, we're just recording. Okay. All right. So. Um, He's got to land on Facebook. Okay. I was about to say, as soon as you get to a camera and a computer, it's over my head. <laughs> so yeah, y'all have to ask Jeff if somebody knows this land about that. All right. Anybody else this morning? Good to see you in the house of the Lord. Good to see some uh, all the folks that we haven't got to see in a while. Good to have you here with us this morning. But we're going to be in 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter number 3. 2 Peter chapter number 3. Now on Wednesdays we've been kind of going over the book of Revelation and we're getting close to the uh, church of Laodicea. After the church of Laodicea then the Lord comes back. And uh, well, the Lord, the John is called up immediately into the into the air to be with the Lord. Now that's a lot of things that have been asked throughout the Bible. When is the kingdom of God going to take place? They would ask. Them, they would ask Jesus, "What is the sign of your coming?" They would ask him, "When is the end of the world going to be?" And for really over two thousand years, mankind has been asking that question. We want to know, when is the Lord coming back? Is it going to be, is it something that's going to be imminent? Is it something that's going to be in the next month, the next year, the next few days? But one thing we know for sure, the Bible points out that no man knows the day or the hour. No man, not even the angels in, in heaven, but only the Father. But there's a lot of people that will try to make a prediction. But if they make a prediction, I can assure you one thing, the day they predict, is not going to be when the Lord comes back. For he makes it plain. Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 44, In such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. That means that nobody is going to know. It's going to be something that's going to be sudden. When Jesus comes back, it's going to take us unaware. We're not going to be expecting it in our life, in that moment, and then, bam, Jesus is going to come. He's going to call some up to meet with him in the air, and those that have never accepted him as their Lord and Savior, they're going to be left behind. And that's been something that they've been questioning about for years and years and years. But what do we truly know? What do we truly know about Jesus coming back? We know that Jesus in his right 
about it, but in his words, he spoke about it very frequently. Jesus spoke about himself coming back as a reality. And if Jesus speaks about it as a reality, we should understand and know that if Jesus speaks about it, it's going to happen. Jesus is coming back. Matthew chapter number 16 and verse 27. He said, The Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His angels. Now that hasn't happened yet, but rest assured, one day it will. Jesus will come back. It's something that was anticipated all through the New Testament. It's something that's been written about. It's something that's been spoken about. But when Jesus comes back, how do we know if we're going to be ready? Peter, right here in his second book. Chapter number 3, and let's begin in verse number 9. Chapter 3, and verse number 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But his long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, as we humbly bow before you this beautiful day, Lord, we thank you for each one that's come out. We thank you for our help. Lord, we thank you for your blessing. We thank you for the love that you bestowed upon us. And Lord, now, as we're drawing to a crucial time in our nation's history, we pray, Lord, that you might just convict the hearts of our nation, that we might choose the right path, the right leaders. Lord, help us that uh, you would lay upon our hearts the ones that we need to vote for. Lord, we pray for the nomination that's been made for the Supreme Court. That, Lord, they may be allowed to be voted in, securing that position. And, Lord, I pray that Roe versus Wade would be overturned. That abortion would be abolished in our world, in our nation. Lord, we ask that you might just be with us today as we meet. That, Lord, you might help us that we would learn and we would open up our hearts, we would open up our minds, and we'd be receptive to the things that you have for us, helping us to know what kind of person that we ought to be in this day that we live in. And Lord, this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now I want you to think with me on the thought this morning, what type of people ought we to be? Because that's what Peter is laying out. He said the Lord is, he, he is long-suffering to us, but he's not willing that any should perish. He wants all to be saved. He wants you right now, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to be saved. He wants you to know him. He wants you to live throughout eternity with him. But he said, rest assured, know for a fact that Jesus is coming back. But then he says, the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be? Who should you be? How should you live? How should you act? How should you respond to the knowledge that you have of Jesus? Number one, I want you to think with me. What type of people we ought to be? We ought to be people that are waiting. And you know, waiting is something that's hard for all of us to do. Yesterday, long story short, my daughter's truck had a problem, so I thought we had it fixed. We were going to take it 
two her yesterday. We go up and we eat in Florence. And uh, while we're eating, Kim says, I would like to go to Belk for a few minutes. Okay? I said, okay, I'll just wait in the truck. She said, how long do I have? I said, oh, 20 minutes. I'll just play on my phone a little bit. 20, maybe 30 minutes. Two and a half hours later. <laughs> I was waiting beside her because we found out J.C. Penney was going out of business. Oh. I found myself waiting as a human clothes hanger. I found myself waiting as a pack mule. I found myself waiting in line to check out not once, but twice. Waiting is not something we do voluntarily. Waiting makes us anxious because we're looking at the time that we are wasting. What kind of people ought we to be? We ought to be people that are waiting on the return of the Lord. Because the time that we spend here on this earth, it is valuable time. The Bible says we can redeem the time. We can buy back some of the time, but there are things that we ought to do, the people that we ought to be in order to redeem that time, means that we walk with a holy conversation. It means that we walk in righteousness and godliness. You know, sometimes, and I put Josh on the prayer list, sometimes when we wait on a loved one because of their health and because of issues, we wait and we worry. We wait and we wonder. We forget that God is in control of it all. That all of the things that are going on around us are on God's timetable. But we wait and we get anxious. Sometimes we wait and while we wait, we can even give up hope. Because we don't see the result that we expect. We don't see the result that we long for. Sometimes we wait and we get envious. Because we look at the things that are happening in my life right now, Somebody else seems like they've got it so easy. They've got it all figured out. Everything seems to be smooth for them, and we get envious of that. But the Bible makes it very clear how we should wait. While we wait, we should be working. You and I have got enough to do in our life. From the instruction that the Word of God has given us, you and I have enough to do to fill our time while we wait on the Lord to come back. To do something positive. To do something gracious. To do something loving. To do something giving. You see, when our focus is on Him, we're not so worried so much about how long we're standing in line. We're not worried so much about what the outcome of a loved one is going to be. When he is our focus, we are focused upon the kingdom of God and not this individual that's in the kingdom. While we're waiting, as we find in verse number 11, it says, What manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? While we're waiting, wait with a godly life. For you and I, the Bible tells us that we are to walk in the light. That means as a Christian, we should not be ashamed of who we are. We should not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. While we wait for him to come back, while we wait for this life that we live to end, we should be proud to know that Jesus is our Lord. Verse number 12. We should be waiting in anticipation, looking for it, and hasting unto the coming of the day of the Lord. Expecting. You know, if you ever think about it, through our week last week, how many of us at any moment in time were anticipating Jesus to come back? Were we longing for Jesus to come back? You know, we look at the life we live right now, some of us have a pretty good life. Some of us have uh, things worked out pretty well. Some of us struggle with social things. Some of us struggle with the people around us. Some of us struggle with the mental issues. We all have different things. We have lives that are good. We have lives that are hard. We have lives that are bad. But I promise you one thing right now. 
when the Lord comes back, you will not be disappointed if you're a child of Jesus. No matter what kind of life you live. No matter what's going on around you right now. If you're saved and Jesus comes back, you're not going to be disappointed. While we wait, live in anticipation. But then I want you to notice the second thing we ought to be. The other type of people we ought to be. Not only people that are waiting, but people that are diligent. You know what happens? Urgency replaces apathy. Apathy, just picture a sloth. A sloth is one of those animals that spends most of its day sleeping or moving very slow or eating. Just hanging out in the tree. Doesn't get much done. Doesn't go very far. But you know another... I guess this is an insect. Not an animal, but an insect that's very diligent. The Bible mentions an ant. Have you ever noticed when you kick the top off of an ant hill what happens? An ant goes to work. I mean, it just goes crazy trying to repair and fix everything. But then what happens when you kick the top of it off after it's fixed it? You know, I always want to just look down and see if that little ant doesn't stick his front two legs up and look up and say, Why? That's what we do. But that's not what happens. The ant goes to work again. Why? Because it's diligent. Because there is a job that it has been tasked to do. You see, you and I, in our Christian walk, we have been called upon to be diligent. We're not working to see achievements on our behalf. We are working to be faithful to the calling of our Lord and Savior. We haven't been called upon to get results. We've been called upon to work. So no matter what task it is that you've been given, no matter what work it is that God has laid out there for you to do, be diligent in that task. That's how you live. With that right conversation. That word conversation, by the way, it means lifestyle. That's how you live in that godly style. And then risk replaces fear. You know, if we really, truly believe that Jesus is coming back, we should risk telling someone about him. And you wonder, is it a big risk if I tell somebody about Jesus? You risk getting made fun of. You risk being ridiculed. You risk being persecuted. But is that really a big risk? Is it something that we fear? Is it something that makes us uncomfortable? Is it something that we kind of push off to the side? You see, if we truly believe that Jesus is coming back and we know that hell is real and people that don't know him end up in hell, should we not risk telling those that we love, telling those that are out there struggling in this world about Jesus dying on the cross, giving his life so that we could have life? And then excellency replaces mediocrity. You see, we shouldn't settle as a Christian to just get by. We shouldn't settle as a Christian to just show up when the doors are open. You know what mediocrity is? Reading one or two verses in her Bible and saying, I've read my Bible for the day. Mediocrity is bowing your head and saying a couple of words of prayer and saying, I've got my prayer time. Mediocrity is only showing up upon occasion and thinking I'm doing my due diligence to the Lord. Mediocrity is walking through life and trying to do good things and not reaching out to those that are around us. But if we are called upon to be diligent, to be steadfast, to be unmovable, to be always abounding in the work of the Lord. If we have been called upon to be that as one of His children, and we have, then we've got to realize that excellency has to take the place 
of mediocrity. We have to excel as a child of God. We have to go and do more than we've ever done before because Jesus, Jesus is going to inspect everything that we do. He's going to lay it all out there before us. He's going to make it plain and simple. And he's going to inspect everything that we do. Number three, we need to be people that are on guard. Because if we're not careful right now, we can get discouraged. We can get discouraged when an election is lost. We can get discouraged when a loved one refuses to listen. We can get discouraged when a loved one gets help, gets um, a sick. We can get discouraged when we look around and we see the shape of the world around us. But you know what God has done? He's given us promises. He's given us His Word. He's given us His Spirit. He's given us the assurance that we can overcome. And who is He that overcomes? But He that believeth that Jesus is the Christ. You can be an overcomer. You can overcome the conflicts, the struggles, the strife, the worries, the fears, the temptations. You can overcome that because of Jesus living inside of your heart. You can excel. You can be on guard. Because you know what you're guarding? You are guarding a treasure. Your testimony. Your life is a treasure, something to be valued, something to be carried with caution. Because as soon as you make that commitment, as soon as you make that rededication, as soon as you make that promise that you're going to begin to live diligent, that you're going to anticipate, that you're going to wait upon the Lord, the devil will come. We've got to guard against discouragement. Because we will slip up. And it's easy to get discouraged when you do. We will have struggles in coming. And it's easy to get discouraged when you do. But we've got to guard against error. Notice verse number 17. Ye therefore, beloved, see ye know these things. Before, beware lest ye also be led away with the error of the wicked. Fall from your own steadfastness. Now he's not talking about salvation. He's talking about being deceived. He's talking about being led astray. He says we've got to guard against that error that can come in to the house of God. And then the final thing I want you to notice what kind of people we ought to be. We ought to be people that are growing. You know, growth is normal. You look at these two little babies. If it wasn't that long ago, they were very, very small. But yet they're growing. Just like all of us, we are to grow. The Bible says we begin with a sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. But then we are to get to the place in our life where we desire the meat of the word. Because we have reached a certain place of maturity. Salvation is described as a new birth. With our salvation, with our salvation comes with comes with a requirement of growing in the spirit. But growth doesn't come by something dramatic. Growth doesn't come by some instant solution. Growth doesn't come from special means. God has it laid out that our growth is a process. Step by step by step. Trusting Him and stepping out those small steps of faith that He has called upon us to take for Him when He opens up a door that no man can shut. When He provides to us a window of opportunity that He calls upon us to step through. The type of people we ought to be is one that lives by faith strong enough that we step forward when he opens that door. Growing in our faith, but also growing in our knowledge. Knowledge of who we are. Knowledge of what Jesus has done. Knowledge 
of what we are to do. You ever thought much about what we are to do? As a Christian, what are you supposed to do? What kind of people ought we to be? We ought to be the type of people that are desiring to do more. Desiring to love more. I like in the bulletin. Where's my bulletin? Is that me? I liked in the bulletin where it said, Love unlovable people because we have all been unlovable at times. People usually need love the most in those moments when they deserve it the least. We are to be the one, the type of people that we ought to be are to be the one that loves those that deserve the love the least. That's the type of people that we ought to be. But it takes a closer walk with Jesus to get to that place. Can you love somebody that curses you? Can you love somebody that hurts your family? Can you love somebody that despitefully uses you? Can you love somebody that takes advantage of you? It's hard unless you're very close the Christ. You see, he told us, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You have to have Jesus living in your heart to such an extent that our personal feelings and emotions are pushed aside and our desire to please him, to live for him and do for him moves to the forefront. We've all got room to grow. We've all got a place to strive for. As they come and prepare songs of invitation for us this evening, this morning. You know, I wonder, since salvation begins with grace, Christians are to live by grace, and God gives grace, grace should teach us how to live. Grace should teach us what to keep. Grace should teach us what to deny. The world changes, but God's grace is sufficient for every need. So if you stand with me this morning, at 65, if there's a need, God's grace is sufficient. If there's hurting, God's grace is